Okay, guys, I want to talk a little more about what's going on with not only the Kavanaugh nomination, but also really the issue that I think most of you should think about when assessing the attitude of Democrats towards the Supreme Court today. And that's why it's a little bigger than just the issue, the issue of whether Kavanaugh is uh, covering something up or whether, you know, of course, the Democrats are trying to smear him. Uh, I do happen to think that the charges are not credible, just for the record. And I think that Kavanaugh will probably, you know, in, in the end, I don't think the people who are claiming that he <laughs> groped this woman, they're really looking at it with a eye towards justice. It's, it's clearly just a vendetta against somebody in order to prevent him from being on the court. So the, the latest development is from the Washington Examiner is that a witness reportedly named by Christine Blasey Ford is one of the people at the high school party where Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh allegedly assaulted her, told the Senate Judiciary Committee on Saturday she was not there. She was not there. So an, a, another eyewitness supposedly at the party was not at the party. The attorney for Leland Ingham Kaiser told the Senate Judiciary Committee that Kaiser t does not remember being at the party for describes the location of the alleged assault. Ms. Kaiser does not know Mr. Kavanaugh, and she has no recollection of ever being at a party or gathering where he was present with or without Dr. Ford, Kaiser said in a statement. CNN reported Kaiser is a lifelong friend of, of uh, Ford's. Kaiser, whom the New York Times reported is one of the people Ford named as being in attendance at the party, is the third witness who is denied knowing about the alleged assault. Mark Judge and Mark Patrick Smith said earlier this week they did not remember the party in question. Kavanaugh has denied for his allegations. So that's actually four people, if you include Kavanaugh himself, who can't remember anything about what Christine Blasey Ford has said. Um, and and that's that's really something that, if, if you realize the magnitude of that, there are four people who are refuting the alleged um the, the, the alleged charges against Kavanaugh, against one person who's making them. There's all this NHL trivia on the screen, but um, let me see here. I think. Yeah, I got that one right. Um, <laughs> so committee chairman Senator Chuck Grassley, re Republican of Iowa, had repeatedly extended deadlines set for Ford's team on this on the decision including three on Friday and one at 2.30 p.m. Saturday, Grassley threatened to proceed with a committee vote on Kavanaugh's nomination Monday if he did not hear from Ford. I've heard that he, he's actually now moved it back again, which I think is, is really a major mistake on his part. And he says, five times now we have granted extension for, Ms., for Dr. Ford to de decide if she wants to proceed with her desire stated one week ago that she wants to tell the Senate, her story, Grassley tweeted Friday, Dr. Ford, if you changed your mind, say so, so we can move on. I want to hear your testimony. Come to us or we to you. The extended discussions have been labeled a delaying tactic by some Republicans. Ford's attorneys and Grassley's aides will reportedly continue negotiations Sunday on the details of the conditions of Ford's testimony per the New York Times. So I, I want to say this, okay? First of all, <coughs> There's already the matter of how many people, um, how many people are, uh, are are already refuting her story, okay? <clears throat> and I want people to, to let that sink in. You have the, the word of four people against one, or at least four people who deny the actual, who say that her her version of the story doesn't really match up, okay? <clears throat> Then you have the issue of the delaying tactics. If you're somebody who suddenly has this epiphany that after 36 years you're ready to come out with the truth, but now you're trying to negotiate the, 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 this, you know, the delivery of the testimony, that's not the behavior of somebody who's actually trying to uh, you know, get the truth out. People should know that Kim.com, who claims he has knowledge of what actually happened with regards to the 
to the DNC hacking or the DNC leaking during the 2016 election, he repeatedly says he's willing to come before Congress and testify openly about the evidence he has. He doesn't really, he, he doesn't do this ridiculous negotiation. Okay, now I get it that that's not the exact same case. And if you feel that, 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 that that's an objectionable comparison, then sue me. Because the reality is if you're, so, if you, you're such a, a martyr that you're willing to come out and say, fuck yeah, this is, the, this, is what I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna go out on, you know, guns blazing or whatever. You don't hem and, and hedge about all these things. Oh, I'm not willing to come forward. It's, it's not comfortable. Uh, I, you, you find a way. There was, by the way, an offer to have her deposed uh, you know, have with deposition, by the way, a lot of people who are not familiar with legal terms is simply the recording of testimony outside of, 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 of the formal court or uh, place of <coughs> place of testimony. In this case, it's the Senate. So that would have been very fine. They would have just sent a lawyer to uh, the Bay Area where she lives and they would have recorded her testimony. And they were, it would have been presented to these senators, and then I guess they would have made their decision, and that's about it. And and by the way, the if if her objection to that would have been, the, I mean, I don't, I don't understand what the objection would have been because, but but I think I have an idea. Okay, her objection is this: if her story becomes recorded publicly and people are able to actually examine it. And pick it apart. <coughs> she she feels that it wouldn't hold muster to, to real scrutiny. It would actually probably end up creating more questions than answers. And indeed, up until now, everything she's done creates more, it gives more room to ask more questions and ask you know what the hell are you talking about than it is to answer exactly, you know, to, to, to shed some more light on Kavanaugh or anything like that. So in reality, the, the ideal situation for her would be this, to testify before closed doors, as a lot of these other people who have, who have you know, that they, they've refused to testify. You know, you have this Nellie Orr in the Russia Gate case who's refu who, who has refused to testify. She's probably going to end up being subpoenaed. If she refuses the subpoena, who, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, in this case, <coughs> so so these people they want to appear before closed doors because then they then they start to say, well, if people really knew what I have to say, I'd get death threats. Well, okay, then why are you saying you want you want this to be shared with, you know, why why are you saying that you want your testimony to be taken into account when the public might not even get to to, to hear it, according to a lot of these terms. Uh, I, I remember that last week Christine Ford also claimed, you know, she, she asked that her testimony be after Kavanaugh's, which is unreasonable because he's the one being accused, not her. So he should be able to, to answer the accusation. Do you understand what that means? He has to refute an allegation that hasn't even been formally made. That's a major problem. And then there was another term, I believe, that she not be asked to testify with him in the room. And I guess I heard that technically that's fine as long as he's able to watch her testimony on video. But, but again, this, this is a woman <coughs> who, you know, if, if she's so courageous about coming forward, then it shouldn't be that hard to get her on the record. She's gone on the record with newspapers. So I, I do want to say another thing on the Supreme Court in general. Supposing that the Democrats were able to filibuster this one pick and then keep it, <coughs> you know, keep keep Kavanaugh off the bench for the time being. What happens in the future? You know, the, you, you don't have Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, so you have one vacancy. So, so at the moment, it's four against four. What happens when eventually, as, as is going to happen, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is no longer able to serve on the court or she's... She's, uh, <coughs> she could die, you know. What exactly happens? Then you have two open seats, then it's four against three. So you're going to filibuster and, 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 obstruct, and obstruct two Supreme Court justice spots because of Donald Trump. I, I, want, you, I want you to notice that this is Sandra Day O'Connor, 
who uh, she was appointed to the Supreme Court in the early 80s by President Reagan. Okay, I think she was the first Supreme Court justice appointed by, by Ronald Reagan. And um, <coughs> she served for 26 years on the court, and she, she retired. And, and I think that if, if Ginsburg had been honest with herself, have been honest with her, you know, her admirers. And there's some bizarre admirers of, of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You know, there's there was an article. You know, I'll try to find it. It's cringeworthy. So, if she would have been honest with her followers, she would have probably... Uh, you know, gone and, and retired long ago and, and you know, let somebody of, of you know, even a similar vision um, c come forward and say, <coughs> you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the new person uh, to, to, you know, that, sorry, it's so incoherent. I'm just trying to pick the right article. If, if she would have been honest with her followers, if she would have been honest with America, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have retired six or seven years ago. This is a person, <coughs> and, and you know, maybe I'm exaggerating, but you, you need to be able to leave the, gr leave the groundwork for somebody to continue your work. You know, President Obama would have been able to appoint somebody similar to his philosophy. It's not something I would have picked. You know, I, I don't really agree with President Obama on much. But instead, she chose to cling to the seat. And soon she's, she's not really going to be able to. Uh, and, and there's pe these people making this, this ridiculous um, hero worship here. It says that 85 years young, Ginsburg is a strict, rigorous workout routine. When asked by Politico in 2017 who the most important person in her life was, Ginsburg answered, my personal trainer. The oldest justice works out with Brian Johnson twice a week for about an hour per session. The workouts typically start at around 7 p.m. at a gym inside the Supreme Court, and she listens to PBS News Hour while she exercises. The RBG workout is real and a bestseller. Okay. <laughs> She's about to become an action figure. A Kickstarter campaign <coughs> recently lobbied to create a Ginsburg action figure complete with pulled back hair, wire rim glasses, and an iconic jaba. I think that's the stupid thing she wears around her neck. Um, $613,000 was pledged. Good Lord. There will be a flavor of tea named after her, the tea book. So, this, so people are basically worshiping this person. All she does is write legal opinions. There's tons of judges all around the country that write legal opinions. That, that does not make somebody, uh, you know, extra special. I've certainly, you know, th there are Supreme Court justices, of course, that I've heard about for years. And, I, you know, some of them I think are, are pretty, you know, obviously I think all of them are smart, including, I, I, you know, by the way, Ginsburg, you know, I don't understand her judicial philosophy, but obviously <coughs> she accomplished enough to be able to get appointed to the court. But you, you don't make superheroes out of people who, who basically just write legal opinions. She's not going anywhere anytime soon. Ginsburg said she hopes to remain on the court for another five years. My senior colleague, Justice John Paul Stevens, he stepped down when he was 90. So I think I have at least five more years, she said, according to CNN. She hired law clerks for the next few terms, taking her at least through 2020. I don't think it's going to happen. And based on some of the live interview, let's see if there's uh, some, you know, some live footage of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the recent recent past. <coughs> so this is her. So, looking ahead a little bit. Barely um, conscious. Last week, we uh, saw the Senate hold confirmation hearings for a nominee to your court. Um, many observers have said that the process today looks nothing like your confirmation hearing 25 years ago. Uh, President Clinton nominated you uh, in June of 1993, and you were confirmed by the Senate two months later by a vote of 96 to 3. 
Uh, I might add that the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association was pleased to support your nomination. <laughs> How would you compare the process that you went through with what's going on today in that process? The way it was, was right. The way it is, is wrong. The, the atmosphere in 93 uh, was truly bipartisan. The vote on my confirmation was 96 to 3. Even though I had spent about 10 years of my life litigating cases under the auspices of the ACLU board, uh, ACLU, and I was on the ACLU board and one of their general counsel. My White House handlers asked me questions about my ACLU affiliation. They were very nervous about it. And I said, forget, forget it, just forget it. There's nothing you can do that will lead me to badmouth the ACLU. And not a single question. No senator asked me any question mm. not about that. Um, it was the same for Justice Breyer, who was nominated a year later. He had in, in the 90s um, the numbers. Or think of Justice Scalia, who is certainly a known character in, in what was it, 1986? He, he had been a law professor and written many things. He, was, he had been on the D.C. Circuit. The vote was unanimous, every Democrat. And every Republican voted for him. But that's the way it should be, instead of what it's become, a highly partisan show. Um, the Republicans move in lockstep, and so do the Democrats. I wish I could wave a ma magic wand and have it go back to the way, it, the way it was. So, so yeah, I mean, this is from GOP War Room, but it, it is the raw video from that conference. So, yeah, Sandra Day O'Connor, she retired in 2006. And a number, you know, of course, we had this year, uh, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy retired. I think it was like 80 years old. And, and unfortunately, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, again, she's not a young person. And I believe that, let's say, okay, she's, she's alive, but she has health problems. She could, she could be sidelined from the Supreme Court for a while. So they still have to handle cases. So effectively, you're, you're, you're putting her in John McCain mode, or she's putting herself in John McCain mode. If you don't, if you're not capable of actually being a contributor, then you're going to actually be hurting your own cause, and that's that's really what's going to happen, in my opinion. She probably, you know, it could be, of course, that she, you know, I guess for several more years she's able to contribute. Uh, let's say two more years she's able to contribute on the Supreme Court. Uh, from that video, she doesn't look exactly like. Her, her reflexes are, are exactly the, the best you could you could have. Uh, and, um, you know, her, her statements that, yeah, she could set, serve five more years. Does that really serve the purpose of the court? And what about what if other justices retire? You know, Justice Breyer, 
uh, you know, let me see here. Uh, Stephen Breyer. So this guy is still on the court. He's not, he's, he's 80 years old now. Uh, now, let me see, John Paul Stevens. I think he's already retired. So yeah, he's almost 100 years old. And uh, I would say this, okay? It, it behooves people it behooves people, in my opinion, to leave the court in the hands of, uh, you know, it, in, in, in the hands of, of a more certain uh, situation, okay? And if she would have retired in 2015 and given, or 20, let, let's say she would have retired in 2013, that would have been a good idea for her. Uh, that would have really helped the legacy of President Obama for his own good, and instead, Basically, we're, we're looking at a situation where the majority, like, she will probably be replaced by a Trump nominee. Uh, the other guy, Breyer, will probably be replaced by a Trump nominee. And th that's what they've dug themselves into. So, yes, it is a lifetime appointment. It doesn't mean that the lifetime could be, you, you know, the life. it doesn't mean that it, it's a good idea for you to serve the remainder of your life on the Supreme Court if you're trying to create permanent change afterward. Uh, that's about it. Please uh, like the video, subscribe to the video, and comment below. Also subscribe to my other channel, Razor Ray Live Wounds, and uh, I'll see you guys later.